Hey, Pastor Brett here, and we are continuing our series in Psalm 23. And before we pick up in the psalm where we left off from last time, I want to just read the entire psalm. Psalm 23, King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever." Previously, we looked at the opening five words in this psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And we took a look at each one of those major words, the Lord is my shepherd. Of course, that means that I am part of the, his flock. We are his, we are his sheep. We're, we're his flock. And each one of us individually who has trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are under his care. We are under his management and his oversight. Now, the psalm goes on to say in the rest of that verse, David writes, the Lord is my shepherd. And here's the result of that. He says, I shall not want. Meaning, I'm satisfied with his oversight, with his care, with his provision in such a way that I'm content. This is a statement of contentment. I'm satisfied with the Lord, my shepherd, with his oversight and care of me. Are you able to say that? Are you in a position of contentment? Or are you wrestling with discontentment? So often we as Christ followers do wander away a little bit, maybe from the fold and Perhaps we wrestle with unbelief, and because of that, we doubt the goodness of God in our life, and perhaps circumstances come into our lives where we question, is the shepherd really caring for me well? Is he really watching after me? Is he, is he noticing me, or are his eyes elsewhere? Or is he tending to other members of the flock, and he, he's forgotten me, and he's neglecting me? David was able, as we believe he wrote this near the end of his life, to look back over his life and say confidently, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He looks after me. He provides for me. He cares for me. Even when I'm not certain that he is paying attention, he is. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm content. Do you struggle, though, with discontentment? I know I do. It's, a, it's an ongoing battle. And, and most people I know, most believers, we do have struggles with discontentment. This is a uh, struggle that is common among Christians. But we are to go to the Word of God and be reminded of these wonderful truths that God does care. He's on the throne. He's in control. He is good. And if we truly believe these things, then we're able to filter all the circumstances through those truths and through also, listen to this, His promises for us, that He will care for us, that He will keep us, that He will provide for us. And so, we even take the negative circumstances and the not-so-good stuff in our life, and we filter it through those realities that we get from God's Word to know that God does care. He is watching after us. He is the Good Shepherd. And reach a point of rest to be able to say with David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, the word want there is referring to not being in need of what I truly need. It's important because we often think in terms of the way we use the word want in our language today is we distinguish a want from a need. And really he is here talking about he's talking about needs here and not necessarily desires or dreams that we have and God's going to provide all our dreams. He's going to fulfill all our desires. No. I'm not going to lack I have enough for contentment. God is going to provide enough for me to be content. 
He's going to govern my life and manage my life and oversee my life in such a way that I have opportunity to be content. And contentment can be a choice as we think about and meditate on the truths of who God is and as we look for His hand in the midst of our circumstances. Sometimes that's hard to see, but that's okay. We walk by faith and not by sight. Therefore, we're able to say with the psalmist, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But let me ask you a question. Are you right now content? Are you content with where you are in life? Are you content with what you have? Are you content with your relationships? Now, of course, we all want to grow. We all want to improve things. We're not saying that we shouldn't have goals. We shouldn't aim to improve ourselves, improve our relationships. No, it, it, this is not a statement for laziness. That is not, this is not a statement for complacency. Contentment does not equal complacency. This is not the type of contentment we're talking about. Contentment does not justify behavior that says, I'm apathetic toward life. I don't care. I'm content. No. We're talking about being able to rest and not be anxious over where we're at in life and the lot that God has placed us in at this point in time, but rather we can have peace in the midst of storms. We can have contentment in the midst of uh, distress. He can take us to a place of contentment if we will look for Him and reach out to Him and cry out to Him. So what we want to say is, I'm satisfied with the Lord's leadership in my life. When things are good, that's when it's easy. When things are not so good, that's when it's harder. But as we read through this psalm, as we think through what it says, it it doesn't say God's going to keep us from hardship. In fact, Jesus said that in this life we would have tribulation. He promised that. But He said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So, we're going to walk through dark valleys. Here He refers to the valley of the shadow of death. We're going to have enemies in our lives that are opposing us and bringing opposition and trials into our lives. He talks about that in this psalm. And yet, we will overcome. We will be able to, through God's help and with His grace, make it through to the other side. So, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall. There's a little bit of a future tense mentality in there. He is my shepherd presently. But as I look toward the future, as I'm walking through life, I shall not want. I can be content. To the paths that He leads me to. He talks about, he leads me, he's going to lead me into paths of righteousness. That doesn't mean it's going to be an easy path. In fact, oftentimes the paths of righteousness are the hard paths. But he will guide me. He will provide. And I think it's important at this point that we acknowledge that we can be partially content and then partially non-content. It was uh, the songwriter and famous musician Bob Dylan, who said, most of the time, I'm halfway content. Which means, of course, that most of the time, he's halfway discontent. So there there is a sense in which, in some ways, some areas of our life, we are content. In some areas of your life, your life, my life, we're not content. We need to be grateful for the areas in which we are content, and we need to take it to the Lord and pray about the areas where we are not content. So, are you walking in discontentment at all right now? It's funny. We struggle with being satisfied with what God gives us. God has blessed us in so many ways. One of the helpful exercises that we can engage in at times is to write out all the things we can be thankful for. To count our blessings. As the old hymn writer wrote, count our blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. So it's good for us to focus on the blessings we have, but it's also part of our flesh and part of our human nature at times to forget about the good we have and just kind of focus on what we can't have. Melissa Kruger tells a story about when she had a, uh, I guess you'd call them a play date, where she met up with a handful of other moms and 
they met at a playground area, and all their kids of younger to you know different ages um, were playing on the playground, and they as the moms were sitting there chatting and visiting while their kids played, and they, it was a nice, safe, enclosed playground with a fence around it. And at one point, though, the, the older kids, about seven of them, came over to the, the mothers and asked, can we go to that field outside the fence to play? And so the mothers conferred with one another, and they said, no, we're sorry. We need you to stay in the playground. And their reason was, although these kids were probably old enough to be responsible in the open field, this would create a desire for the smaller kids to want to go over there as well and play, which on the other side of the field was a very busy uh, street. And they, were, they had a ball they wanted to play with. What if the ball ran out in the street and one of the kids ran out and all that? So they didn't want to have to worry. The moms want to be able to go ahead and visit without having to be constantly worrying and looking over if the little kids were over there. And then they don't want the kids complaining, little kids complaining, if the older kids. If you've had kids of different ages and been in these situations, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So they said, no, we need you to stay in the fenced-in area. It's a great playground. So she said, we told them no. They went on out to play. And she said, we moms continued our chatting. And she said, about five minutes later, I looked up. And there were seven older kids standing right against the fence, just staring out at the field, longingly wanting to be in that field. She said behind them was a wonderful playground with monkey bars and and swings and things to climb on, things to play on, all this stuff that was in a safe environment where they could play, but they weren't satisfied with that. They were staring at what they couldn't have and that which was denied to them. She said as she looked out and saw that, she suddenly realized that that she was that way a lot in her life as well. She had a tendency to forget about all the things she had and to not enjoy all that she had, but instead look out over the things that God, for whatever reason, said no You can't have that right now in your life. And she spent too much time thinking about those kind of things. I wonder how that speaks to us today. Are there some things that you wish God would change in your life and you're having a hard time enjoying what He has provided for you and how He has cared for you because you're looking at what you don't have and frustrated that you don't have that? Discontentment. As Christians, we believe the Bible teaches that God is sovereign over all, that He's in control, and there's nothing that comes into our life that doesn't enter into our life without His permission, that there's nothing that we would desire to have, that if He wanted us to have it, we could have it. And we also believe the Bible teaches that God is good. Our shepherd is sufficient. He is strong enough. He's big enough. He's in control, and His heart's good. He has skillful hands, I'm speaking metaphorically here, and he has a true, right, good heart as our shepherd. And so, whatever our situation is right now, yes, he may want to rescue us out of it. It's not that we're stuck in it. If we call out to him, he may rescue out. In Exodus chapter 2, the the people of Israel were in bondage to the the Egyptians in slavery, and and they cried out to the Lord, the Bible says. In the end of Exodus chapter 2, it says, God heard their cries. And so what did God do? He sent them a deliverer. So sometimes God will deliver us out of the bad circumstances and change our circumstances. And maybe sometimes he allows the negative stuff in our life so we will call out to him and And so He can show Himself strong on our behalf and rescue us and and help us out of problems or difficult trials. And then we can rejoice and give Him glory. And So that's part of the journey as well. But if He's not currently rescuing us, but He's keeping us in whatever it is we're not happy about, or if He's currently not giving us what we wish we could have and what we long for, then He wants us to be content in this moment. Whatever this moment may be, we need to be looking to Him for contentment and satisfaction from Him and to be able to say, Lord, we trust You. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You see, discontentment is a lack of trusting God in managing our lives well. When we say, 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We're saying, Lord, we're satisfied with how you are managing our lives. Discontentment says, I don't trust God. He's not enough for me. Now notice also, it's not just about the circumstances or what just what we have, about what we have. It's also about the person. We have the person of God. We have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. And that's a significant thing, such a significant thing that really, if we really understood that, we shouldn't let too many other things bother us. If God is for us, who can be against us? If I'm right with Him, that's all that really matters. Paul, writing from prison cell in Philippians chapter 1, was threatened with death. He says, eh, I'm content with that. Because for me to live is Christ. I get to have Christ in my life on this earth. But for me to die is gain because then I get to be with Christ. A Christian is always in a win-win situation. Yes, we may fail and stumble at times, but we're with God and He protects us and He keeps us and He forgives us and He loves us and He cares for us at all times. So it's always a win-win. Therefore, I can be content and satisfied with His management of my life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What are the current challenges in your life? What do you feel like? What do you feel like you're lacking in your life that keeps you from contentment? Look to the Lord as your portion. Look to the Lord as your provider. Look to the Lord as your strength to take you through the difficult time, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a personal illness, a relational conflict, whatever it may be, a difficult job situation, a lack of a job, whatever your situation is right now, find your contentment in your good shepherd and cry out to him. Ask him to bring you to a place of, although you want to find a job or although you want to find a better job or, or although you, whether you want to be healed or, or whatever your situation is, while you wait, Ask Him to give you a contented heart in Him. Philip Keller, in his wonderful book, uh, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, he tells about one of the members of his flock who was constantly discontent. I want to share this story with you. Keller writes, In spite of having such a master and owner, he's talking about a, a wonderful Savior that we have in Jesus, a wonderful master, wonderful owner. He's using the shepherd analogy here. The fact remains that some Christians are still not content with his control. They're somewhat dissatisfied, always feeling that somehow the grass beyond the fence must be a little greener. These are carnal Christians. One might almost call them fence crawlers or half Christians who want the best of both worlds. I once owned a ewe whose conduct exactly typified this sort of person. She was one of the most attractive sheep that ever belonged to me. Her body was beautifully proportioned. She had a strong constitution and an excellent coat of wool. Her head was clean, alert, well set with bright eyes. She had sturdy lambs that matured rapidly. But in spite of all these attractive attributes, she had one pronounced fault. She was restless, discontented, a fence crawler. So much so that I came to call her Mrs. Gadabout. This one you produced more problems for me than almost all the rest of the flock combined. No matter what field or pasture the sheep were in, she would search all along the fences or shoreline, we lived by the sea, looking for a loophole so she could crawl through and start to feed on the other side. It was not that she lacked pasturage. My fields were my joy and delight. No sheep in the district had better grazing. With Mrs. Gadabout, it was an ingrained habit. She was simply never contented with things as they were. Often when she had forced her way through some spot in a fence or found a way around the end of of the wire at low tide on the beaches, she would end up feeding on bare, brown, burned-up pasturage of an inferior sort. But she never learned her lesson and continued to fence crawl time after time. Now, it would have been bad enough if she was the only one who did this. It was a sufficient problem to find her and bring her back. But the further point was that she taught her lambs the same tricks. They simply followed her example and soon were as skilled at escaping as their mother. 
Even worse, however, was the example she set for the other sheep. In a short time, she began to lead others through the same holes and over the same dangerous paths down by the sea. After putting up with her perverseness for a summer, I finally came to the conclusion that to save the rest of the flock from becoming unsettled, she would have to go. I could not allow one obstinate, discontented you to ruin the whole ranch operation. It was a difficult decision to make, for I loved her in the same way I loved the rest. Her strength and beauty and alertness were a delight to the eye. But one morning, I took the killing knife in hand and butchered her. Her career of fence crawling was cut short. It was the only solution to the dilemma. She was a sheep who, in spite of all that I had done to give her the very best care, still wanted something else. She was not like the one who said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It is a solemn warning to the carnal Christian, the backslider, the half-Christian, the one who wants the best of both worlds. Sometimes, in short order, they can be cut down. Reminds me of Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1, which says this, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Dear Christian, it's not just a nice, lovely statement, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It is the way we must live. It is dangerous for us to not find our contentment in God. It is dangerous for us not to be satisfied with His care of our lives. It is dangerous for us and for those around us for us to demand to go outside His care and outside of His provision because we're unsatisfied with Him and His provision. So let us not be like the wandering sheep, but instead let us be content in Christ and what He does for us and how He leads us, cares for us, protects us, and provides us for us. Let's go to Him in prayer right now. Father, we come before You in the name of Jesus, and we thank You that You provide for us, that You care for us, that You're compassionate. You're the Good Shepherd. Forgive us when we doubt Your goodness. But yet, Lord, we want to acknowledge and we do say to you, Lord, sometimes it, it's strange, your ways. And your word says that. God, your word says sometimes your, your ways are strange to us. And Lord, for almost all of us who followed you for a while, our plans have been set aside and you've provided other plans. In some cases, plans we wouldn't have chosen, pathways we wouldn't have chosen, but yet you know what's best for us. So you call us to trust in you. And Lord, your word also says that you go about testing our faith and trying us. So Lord, help us to know when you're testing our faith, you're still worthy of following. You still care. You still love. And help us to find our contentment in you. In Jesus' name, amen.